As a planet populated by humans with nowhere else to go, have 100 seconds left to live. As of January 23, 2020, humanity teeters on the brink of self-destruction. While this sounds like the start of an apocalyptic disaster movie, it most certainly is nothing of the sort. This is a worrying fact of life in the 21st century. The Doomsday Clock is a warning of man's ability to create something that could destroy everything. Humanity's very existence, a countdown timer to the point of no return. Humanity's Doomsday. The Doomsday Clock symbolizes how close we, as a species, have come to destroying the world with dangerous man-made technologies. The deadline of midnight represents the moment of apocalypse, and how close the clock is set to that deadline warns how close humanity is to ultimate disaster. With the intention of warning the public and inspiring action, the clock's hands are set in accordance to how great is the threat of destruction. Now, in the 21st century, we are closer to doomsday than ever before. Only twice in the clock's history have the Doomsday Clock's hands been set at a worrying two minutes to midnight, which inspired British rock band Iron Maiden's song of the same name. Two Minutes to Midnight first occurred in 1953, when the U.S. and the Soviet Union both tested thermal nuclear weapons, and once again in 2018, when a breakdown in the international order of nuclear actors, as well as continuing apathy on the subject of climate change, were cited as a threat to our planet's safety. The Doomsday Clock is used to represent threat from a variety of sources, development of nuclear weaponry and weapons of mass destruction, and these days, factors of climate change are included in the deliberations. In 2007, the bulletin first began including catastrophic disruptions caused by climate change when it considered the changes in setting the minute hand on the clock. Founded in 1945 by biophysicist Eugene Rabinowitz and physicist Hyman Goldsmith, the bulletin began as a newsletter to inform interested members of the public about the growing technology of atomic warfare and weaponry and the dangers that an atomic war could bring about. One of the more notable scientists to contribute to the bulletin is J. Robert Oppenheimer. He was the wartime head of the Los Alamos Laboratory and one of those credited with being the father of the atomic bomb for his role in the Manhattan Project, the World War II undertaking that developed the first nuclear weapon. Oppenheimer was one of the scientists who observed the Trinity test in New Mexico, the first successful detonation of the atomic bomb on July 16, 1945. He later remarked that it brought to mind the words of the Bhagavad Gita, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. His prophetic words came true in August 1945, when the weapons he helped develop were used in the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Many of scientific greats have contributed to the bulletin over the years and include Albert Einstein, one of the greatest physicists of all time, Edward Teller, one of the scientists credited with being the father of the hydrogen bomb, Hans Bethe, 1967 Nobel Prize for Physics winner, Brock Chisholm, 
Canadian psychiatrist, medical practitioner, World War I veteran, and the first Director General of the World Health Organization. Bernard T. Fell, who helped develop the atomic bomb and later led a movement to abolish nuclear weapons. James Frunk, 1925 Nobel Prize for Physics winner. Ralph E. Lapp, who participated in the Manhattan Project. Louis Rittenau, who was involved in the U.S. development of radar. Nikolai Semyonov, 1956 Nobel Prize for Chemistry winner. Leo Salad, in 1933, he conceived the nuclear chain reaction. In 1934, he patented the idea of a nuclear fission reactor, and in 1939, he wrote the letter for Albert Einstein's signature that resulted in the Manhattan Project building the atomic bomb. Harold C. Urey, 1934 Nobel Prize in Chemistry winner for discovering deuterium. He also helped develop the atomic bomb and contributed to theories on the development of organic life from non-living matter. Many other notable scientists of the past and present have contributed to the bulletin. The walls have ears. Secrecy was a key factor. Most of the people involved in the secret government mission to create the first atomic bomb had no idea what they were building. Only the scientists knew. Some of those scientists had severe misgivings right from the start of the project. That project is well known now, the Manhattan Project. In 1939, Albert Einstein and Leo Szilard, two renowned and respected physicists, wrote to President Franklin Roosevelt to warn him of the atomic bomb's massive potential for destruction. They also included their concerns and suspicions that Germany might be able to build one. Six years later, Szilard, James Frank, and other Manhattan Project scientists produced the Frank Report, a document suggesting the U.S. should announce a public demonstration of the weapon and use it as a threat to force Japan to surrender. They sent the document to the U.S. Secretary of War. The Frank Report contended that the United States should use a prevention is better than cure approach in an attempt to prevent mass destruction. The Frank Report failed to progress, and so almost 70 Manhattan Project scientists and employees signed a petition against the use of the weapon. Neither the document or following petition swayed the government. And on the 6th of August 1945, the U.S. dropped an atomic bomb with the comparison of 15 kilotons of TNT on the city of Hiroshima. One of the greatest blunders of history, Salad said in a note to his future wife, Gertrude Weiss, when he learned the bomb had dropped. On August 9th, another bomb, with a comparison of 25 kilotons, dropped on Nagasaki, with an estimated combined loss of 210,000 Japanese lives. A few days later, on August 15th, Japan's Emperor Hirohito announced Japan's unconditional surrender in World War II in a radio address. He said the reasons for the surrender were down to the devastating power of a new and most cruel bomb. Many of the Manhattan Project scientists met to discuss to inform the public about science and its implication for humanity as a direct response to the devastating news of the dropping of two atomic bombs. By September, they had formed the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists of Chicago. As membership grew, of Chicago was dropped from the title. The mission became to equip the public, policymakers, and scientists with the information needed to reduce man-made threats to our existence. John A. Simpson, a young University of Chicago scientist who had worked on the Manhattan Project and served as the first chairman of the Bulletin, said, For the first time in modern history, scientists were saying that it was necessary to make judgments about what to do with their inventions. As a visual means of portraying the threat posed by nuclear weaponry, the bulletin divides the doomsday clock. 
The clock started running in 1947 when the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists changed its format from a newsletter to a magazine. The first cover featured a clock designed by artist Martel Langsdorff. The iconic design later became known as the Doomsday Clock, probably the most recognizable and lasting representation in popular culture connected to the urgency of nuclear threat. The clock's hands move based upon whether events push humanity closer to or further from nuclear apocalypse. When it was unveiled in 1947, the doomsday clock was set at a worrying seven minutes to midnight. The placement was based on the threat posed by nuclear weapons. According to the bulletin scientists, nuclear weaponry was by far the greatest danger to humanity. The fact has not changed over the years. The minute hand moves closer to midnight in direct response to changing world events. The bulletin's original editor, Eugene Robanowicz, was the first to decide whether the hand should be moved and by how many minutes. An eminent scientist, fluent in Russian, and a leader in the international disarmament movement, Robanowicz kept in touch with scientists of all disciplines in many parts of the world. He took into account all of the information gleaned from other notable experts and using the information, decided where the clock hand should be set. He explained his thoughts and decisions in the pages of the bulletin. 1947, it is seven minutes to midnight, the start of the arms race. On August 29, 1949 in Central Asia, the Soviet Union successfully tested their first nuclear device called RDS-1 or First Lightning, codenamed Joe-1 by the United States at their semi palantix test site in modern-day Kazakhstan. The device had a yield of 22 kilotons of TNT. The Soviets immediately denied testing said device. President Harry Truman announced the news to the American public and heralded the start of the arms race. In response, the bulletin made its own announcement. We do not advise Americans that doomsday is near and that they can expect atomic bombs to start falling on their heads a month or a year from now. But we think they have reason to be deeply alarmed and to be prepared for grave decisions. 1949, it is three minutes to midnight. Despite opposition from many nuclear scientists, the United States went ahead with research into the hydrogen bomb, a weapon more powerful and destructive than previous weaponry, including the atomic bomb. In late October 1952, the United States tested their own thermonuclear device, codenamed Ivy Mike, the bomb. Measuring just six times two meters, obliterated a Pacific Ocean islet on the Marshall Islands. Nine months later, the Soviets tested an H-bomb of their own, codenamed Joe-4. The hands of the Clock of Doom have moved again. Only a few more swings of the pendulum, and from Moscow to Chicago, atomic explosions will strike midnight for Western civilization, the bulletin announced. 1953, it is two minutes to midnight. For the first time, the United States and Soviet Union cooperated to avoid direct confrontation in regional conflicts such as the 1956 Suez Crisis. Joint projects helped to create trust and dialogue between third parties and helped to quell hostilities. Scientists helped establish the International Geophysical Year a series of coordinated, worldwide scientific events intended to raise public awareness. The Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs allowed Soviet and American scientists to interact. Peace between nuclear nations at last seems possible. 1960, it is seven minutes to midnight. Time stands still for a brief moment. 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, 
Leaders of the U.S. and the Soviet Union engaged in a tense 13-day political and military standoff in October of that year. Installation of nuclear-armed Soviet missiles on Cuba, just 90 miles from the U.S. shores, were at the crux of the issue. But President Kennedy also agreed to remove U.S. missiles from Turkey. Editor of the Bulletin, Eugene Rabanowitz and his committee decided to leave the hands of the clock where they stood. They took the resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis as an indicator of longer-term trends. The successful resolution of the crisis and the creation of a dedicated communication channel between Washington and Moscow proved to be positive steps leading toward the first significant arms control agreement between the superpowers. In 1962, it is still seven minutes to midnight, slowing the arms race. In 1963, after the near catastrophe of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the United States and the Soviet Union signed the Partial Test Ban Treaty effectively stopping all atmospheric nuclear testing and signaling the end of a decade of nuclear testing. Though the treaty did not outlaw underground testing, it did represent the first step towards slowing the arms race. The two countries seemed to realize that they must work together in order to prevent nuclear annihilation. 1963, it is 12 minutes to midnight new play enter the nuclear stage. In the years following the Cuban Missile Crisis, while the superpowers waged their Cold War, Asia heated up to boiling point. United States involvement in Vietnam intensified. In 1965, India and Pakistan waged war over Kashmir, and Israel and its Arab neighbors rekindled their own hostilities in the 1967 Six-Day War. Then France and China, two countries that have not signed the Partial Test Ban Treaty, developed their own nuclear weapons in order to assert themselves as global players. As a result, the bulletin's editors moved the clock's minute hand closer toward midnight. The bulletin recognized the possibility that the multitude of regional conflicts could flare at any moment with the potential use of nuclear weapons. 1968, it is seven minutes to midnight. The Bulletin, cautiously optimistic. July 1st, 1968, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was opened for signature and signed by the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and the United States, quickly followed by almost all of the world's nations. Signatories of the MPT agreed that states with nuclear weapons vowed to help the treaty's other co-signers develop nuclear power if they promised not to produce weapons. The nuclear weapon states also pledged to abolish their own arsenals when political conditions allowed for it. Israel, India, and Pakistan refused to sign, but the bulletin remained cautiously optimistic. The great powers have made the first step. They must proceed without delay to the next one, the dismantling gradually of their own oversized military establishments. The MPT is a landmark international treaty whose objective is to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons and weapons technology. To promote cooperation in the peaceful use of nuclear energy and to the further goal of achieving nuclear disarmament, 1969, it is 10 minutes to midnight. United States and Soviet Union sign agreements. On May 26, 1972, President Nixon and Soviet General Secretary Brezhnev signed the ABM Treaty and Interim SALT Agreement in Moscow. For the first time during the Cold War, the United States and Soviet Union agreed to limit the number of nuclear missiles in their arsenals. The treaty limited the number of ABM or anti-ballistic missile sites to two for each country. Added to that, the number of intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine-launched ballistic missiles was frozen at existing levels. 
Most Americans and Soviets hailed the SALT agreements as tremendous achievements, even though there was nothing in the agreements about the development of new weapons or about other missiles, namely single missiles carrying multiple nuclear warheads. Unfortunately, nothing is perfect, and the SALT agreement left the two countries with thousands of warheads pointed at each other and the United States eventually withdrew from the ABM Treaty. 1972. It is 12 minutes to midnight. Original editor of the Bulletin dies. Rabanowicz died in 1973, and the Bulletin's Science and Security Board took over the responsibility of the decision-making. Since then, they meet twice a year to discuss world events and whether the clock needs a reset. The board is made up of scientists and other experts with vast knowledge of nuclear technology and climate change. Part of the board's responsibilities include providing expert advice to governments and international agencies. The board consult with colleagues across a range of specialties and seek the views of the bulletin's board of sponsors, which include 13 Nobel laureates. Smiling Buddha, India's Bomb In 1974, South Asia developed the bomb, and India tested Smiling Buddha, its first nuclear device. Any gains in previous arms control agreements evaporated. The United States and the Soviet Union were frantically modernizing and increasing their nuclear forces in direct contravention to the agreements in the ABM and SALT treaties. The deployment of multiple independently targetable reentry vehicles, MIRV, meant both countries could increase their load of their intercontinental ballistic missiles, meaning there were more nuclear warheads than before. 1974. It is nine minutes to midnight. U.S. Senate refuses to ratify the SALT II agreement. In protest of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, President Jimmy Carter pulled the United States from the 1980 Olympic Games in Moscow and looked for other ways in which the United States could win a nuclear war rather than seeking ways to prevent or avoid war. 1980. It is seven minutes to midnight. The clock is adjusted early in 1981. Ronald Reagan won the presidential election and became the President of the United States in 1981. His gung-ho attitude bolstered the U.S. nuclear stance. Reagan intensified Uvado by scrapping any arms control and he proposed that the best way to end the Cold War would be for the United States to win. Perhaps encouraged by the President, the main goal of the U.S. foreign policy during Reagan's tenure was to win the Cold War and to push back communism. Reagan escalated the Cold War, marking a departure from Nixon, Ford, and Carter's approach. The Reagan administration employed new policies towards the Soviet Union and confronted them on three fronts. Reagan's aim was to decrease Soviet access to high technology and diminish their resources. This plan included a strategy to depress the value of Soviet commodities on the world market. The second tactic included forcing the Soviets to devote more of their economic resources to defense. Then the third and final part of the plan, to increase American defense expenditures to strengthen the U.S. negotiating position came into play. The previously canceled B-1 bomber program and secret development of the B-2 designed to replace the B-1 was revived by the Reagan administration and production of the MX Peacemaker missile was started. In response to Soviet deployment of the RSD-10 Pioneer, the administration installed Persian II missiles in West Germany. 1981. It's four minutes to midnight. Soviet Union boycott the 1984 Olympic Games in Los Angeles. In 1983, 
Reagan proposed the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI. He had so much confidence in the defense shield that he believed it would make nuclear war impossible. The technology was never likely to work, which led to the SDI being renamed as Star Wars by Reagan's detractors. Critics of the SDI claimed the technology simply wasn't there and therefore the attempt would accelerate the arms race. Supporters claimed the SDI gave the president a robust bargaining position. Reagan actively supported anti-communist groups around the world and with a policy known as the Reagan Doctrine, his administration promised aid and assistance to right-wing repressive regimes. During the Soviet-Afghan War, Reagan deployed the CIA's Special Activities Division, SAD, paramilitary officers to train, equip, and lead forces against the Soviet Army. President Reagan's covert action program allegedly assisted in ending the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. U.S.-Soviet relations reached their most bitter point in decades, and dialogue between the two nations slows to a crawl. Every channel of communication has been constricted or shut down. Every form of contact has been attenuated or cut off, and arms control negotiations have been reduced to a species of propaganda, the bulletin informs readers. The United States, rather than trying to stop a nuclear war, instead threatens to provoke a new arms race, taking it into space with an anti-ballistic missile system. 1984. It is three minutes to midnight. Relations improve between U.S. and Soviet Union. On December 8, 1987, the United States and Soviet Union signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which the U.S. Senate approved on May 27, 1988, and Reagan and Gorbachev ratified on June 1, 1988. The agreement banned a whole category of nuclear weapons and was the first of its kind. The INF Treaty banned all short, medium range and intermediate range land based ballistic missiles cruise missiles, and missile launchers. The treaty did not apply to air or sea-launched missiles. 1988. It is six minutes to midnight. Reunification of Germany. 1989 marked the end of the Cold War as the Berlin Wall fell. Over the next three years, one Eastern European country after another would overthrow their Soviet-backed governments. Soviet General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev disavows his predecessor's policies and steps back from any burgeoning revolution. The reforms in the division of Europe put in place after World War II and significantly reduces the risk of an all-out nuclear war. 44 years after Winston Churchill's Iron Curtain speech, the myth of monolithic communism has been shattered for all to see, the bulletin writes. 1990, it is 10 minutes to midnight. In 1991, the clock's hands were set to a massive 17 minutes away from midnight, the furthest from disaster they've ever been. That occurred because of a number of key factors. The collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, and the signing of the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. On July 31, 1991, Europe breathed a sigh of relief as the Cold War was declared officially over. The dismantling of the nuclear arsenals belonging to the United States and Russia began and U.S. President George H.W. Bush and Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev signed the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, known as START. The treaty barred its signatories from deploying more than 6,000 nuclear warheads and a total of 1,600 intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, and bombers. 
The Soviet Union dissolved on December 26. The bulletin also breathed a sigh of relief. The illusion that tens of thousands of nuclear weapons are a guarantor of national security has been stripped away. 1991. It is 17 minutes to midnight. Global military spending continues. January 25th, 1995. The Black Brat Scare occurred. On the northwestern coast of Norway, a team of Norwegian and U.S. scientists launched a Black Brat 12 four-stage sounding rocket. The rocket, designed to study the Aurora Borealis over Svalbard, flew northward, passing through an air corridor between nuclear missile silos in North Dakota all the way to Moscow. The rocket reached an altitude of 903 miles and was mistakenly identified as a U.S. Navy submarine-launched Trident missile. Russian nuclear forces went into high alert as a result, fearing a high-altitude nuclear attack that could blind Russian radar. As a result, the Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, then had to decide whether to launch a retaliatory nuclear strike against the United States. 1995. It is 14 minutes to midnight. India and Pakistan test nuclear weapons. May 11, 1998. India carried out a series of nuclear tests resulting in worldwide outrage and sanctions by a number of major countries, including Japan and the United States. The Pakran 2 Operation Shakti tests were a series of five nuclear bomb test explosions. On May 11th, the first explosion was a fusion bomb. The remaining two were fission bombs, and the last two, also fission bombs, were detonated on May 13th. The test objective was to offer India the capability to build fission and thermonuclear weapons with yields up to 200 kilotons. Each one of the explosions of the Pakran II were described by the chairman of the Indian Atomic Energy Commission to be equivalent to several tests carried out by other nuclear weapon states over decades. India has since designed computer simulations capable of predicting the yields of nuclear explosives whose designs are related to the designs of explosives used in these tests. Pakistan held its own tests three weeks later, a symptom of the failure of the international community to fully commit itself to control the spread of nuclear weapons, the bulletin commented on the tests. 1998. It is 9 to midnight. United States rejects arms control treaties. May 24, 2002 in Moscow, Russia and the United States signed the Strategic Offensive Reductions Treaty. The treaty mandated cuts and deployed strategic nuclear warheads, but ignored cuts to total stockpile warheads. Critically, the treaty was signed without any means for enforcement. June 13, 2002, a cornerstone of strategic stability, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty was nullified. In accordance with the clause that required six months' notice before termination, President Bush started the procedure to nullify back in December 2001. It was the first time in recent history that the United States had withdrawn from a major international arms treaty. As a result of the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, the United States became increasingly concerned about rogue states acquiring nuclear capabilities, as well as the amount of unsecured, weapon-grade nuclear materials globally. Bush supporters declared that it was necessary to withdraw in order to test and build protection for the United States, particularly new nuclear weapons that can destroy hardened and deep buried targets. The withdrawal led to the creation of the American Missile Defense Agency. Putin responded to the American Missile Defense Agency with orders to build up Russia's nuclear capabilities. 2002. It is seven minutes to midnight. 
climate change added to the doomsday's clock's considerations. October 9, 2006, North Korea conducted its first underground nuclear test by detonating a plutonium-based device at the Pumyari nuclear test site in North Hamyang province. The device with an estimated yield of up to one kiloton demonstrated North Korea's nuclear capabilities. The U.S. collected and analyzed air samples a few days after the test and found radioactive debris in those air samples, which confirmed that a nuclear blast had indeed taken place. The UN Security Council condemned North Korea's actions and announced Resolution 1718. The resolution imposed a series of economic and commercial sanctions on the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. On January 6, 2007, North Korea confirmed it had nuclear capability. In February 2007, Following the six-part talks disarmament process, North Korea agreed to shut down the Pyongyang nuclear reactor. The International Atomic Energy Agency again stated it was unable to conclude that Iran's nuclear program was entirely peaceful. Iran ceased all cooperation with the IAEA beyond the minimum required under the Safeguards Agreement. The IAEA Board of Governors decided to report Iran to the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council obligated Iran to implement the additional protocol. Iran claimed its nuclear activities were peaceful and therefore Security Council involvement was malicious and unlawful. In August 2007, Iran and the IAEA made progress and entered into an agreement for resolving remaining outstanding issues. Outstanding issues did not include alleged studies of weaponization by Iran. In a work to rule method, Iran said it didn't address the studies in the IAEA work plan because they weren't included in the plan. The IAEA said the studies needed to be taken seriously, even though it regretted it was unable to provide Iran with a comprehensive and detailed documentation of the studies. Iran said allegations were based on forged documents and fabricated data. Furthermore, Iran said it had received no copies of the documentation and therefore couldn't prove they were forged or fabricated. The United States' concern about the amount of unsecured and unaccounted for weapon-grade nuclear materials proved correct. Unfortunately, it was a mistake on the U.S.'s part. By some sort of mistake, six nuclear weapons were flown out of Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota, to Barksdale's Air Force Base, Louisiana, on a B-52. The nuclear warheads in the missiles should have been removed before the missiles were transported. The missiles, along with their nuclear warheads, remained mounted to the aircraft at both Minot and Barksdale. Various mandatory security precautions for nuclear weapons were in place to protect the warheads. But because the missing missiles and warheads weren't reported, the protection was ineffective for 36 hours. Three colonels and a lieutenant were removed from their posts, while about 65 Air Force members had their permission to handle nuclear weapons withdrawn as a result of the incident. In the countless times our dedicated airmen have transferred weapons in our nation's arsenal, nothing like this has ever occurred. This was a failure to follow procedures. Clearly, this incident is unacceptable to the people of the United States and to the United States Air Force. We owe the nation nothing less than adherence to the highest standards, said Air Force Major General Richard Newton in response to an investigation into the incident. 2007. It is five minutes to midnight. Carbon emissions and limits to global temperature rise. In August 2008, relations became further strained between the United States and Russia when Russia and Georgia fought a five-day war. 2009, the G20 summit in London. 
A fresh start was anticipated when Russian President Dmitry Medvedev and U.S. President Barack Obama met there. They released a joint statement that looked promising for Russia-United States relations. The statement also called on Iran to abandon its nuclear program and to permit foreign inspectors into the country. Later in 2009, in a breakthrough at the Copenhagen Climate Change Conference, climate change policy was raised to the highest political level. Significant advancement in negotiations on the infrastructure needed for effective global climate change cooperation were made. Developing and industrialized countries agreed to take responsibility for carbon emissions and to limit global temperature rise to 2 degrees Celsius. In 2010, Washington and Moscow entered negotiations aimed at further cuts in the U.S. and Russian nuclear arsenals, as well as a follow-on agreement to start. We are poised to bend the arc of history toward a world free of nuclear weapons, the Philippines said. 2010. It is six minutes to midnight. March 11, 2011, a major earthquake created a 15-meter tsunami, which disabled the power supply and cooling of three Fukushima Daiichi reactors, causing all three cores to melt in just three days. The resulting nuclear accident shocked and dismayed the world. The problems of purging the world of nuclear weapons, while still making efforts to harness nuclear power and manage climate change, so far seem to be beyond the capability of the world's political collectives. Added to the nuclear weapon concern and climate and energy problems were potential warlords, such as North Korea's Kim Jong-un and the potential for nuclear war in Northeast Asia. The nuclear situation in the Middle East and South Asia also remained tense. Safer nuclear reactors with better oversight and training were obviously a necessity, as well as a better climate change management on a global basis. The biggest part of the Japanese fleet remained offline for a full calendar year, and as a result, in 2012, nuclear power generation suffered its biggest ever one-year fall. Data from the International Atomic Energy Agency showed that nuclear power plants, including the loss of eight German units, produced 7% less energy than in 2011. 2012. It is five minutes to midnight. Global climate change and Ebola crisis. The hottest year on Earth since records began. Our world faces a catastrophic warming of the planet. Despite positive developments in the climate change arena, existing efforts are inadequate. The United States and Russia launched massive programs to modernize their nuclear triads, and in doing so, undermined existing nuclear weapons treaties. The world's institutions demonstrated a severe lack of competence in addressing the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Technological advances in artificial intelligence and cyber attacks pose further potential threats to international stability. These failures of political leadership endanger every person on Earth, the bulletin warns. 2015. It is three minutes to midnight. Disbelief in science and climate change. Donald Trump's unreasonable statements and reckless rejection of scientific truths lead to substantial increases in the fake news industry. Previously trusted information sources came under attack and fake news found an increasing audience. North Korea conducted its fourth and fifth underground nuclear tests. Global carbon dioxide emissions remain steady when the hope was that they would have decreased and the world continued to heat up.
Advances in synthetic biology like the CRISPR gene editing tool showed great positive potential, as well as a darker side to the technology and the threat of a renewed arms race between the U.S. and Russia gave causes for concern. The hands of the doomsday clock move less than a minute for the first time, suggesting apprehension about major world threats. 2017. It is two and a half minutes to midnight. Obvious and imminent danger. The warning the Science and Security Board now sends is clear. The danger obvious and imminent, the bulletin says, as it moves the clock hands once again to the setting of two minutes to midnight. The Doomsday's clock's setting is the closest to midnight since 1953 when the United States and USSR detonated the first hydrogen bombs. North Korea tested its own nuclear weapons in determined defiance. International diplomacy resorted to childish name-calling, and U.S.-Russia relations headed toward more conflict. The Iran deal was jeopardized, and greenhouse gas emissions increased. We can assume a multitude of cases for the clock's most recent movements, including continuing neglect to address climate change, Trump's abandonment of U.S. effort for decarbonization and his withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, failure of world leaders to deal with the increased threats of nuclear war, the end of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty between the U.S. and increased tensions between the U.S. and Iran, U.S. and Russian nuclear modernization efforts, information warfare threats, and other dangers from disruptive technologies such as synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, and cyber warfare. 2018. It is two minutes to midnight. Announced in units of seconds instead of minutes, 2020 marks the clock's closest approach to midnight even closer to the deadline than that of 1953 and 2018. The bulletin concluded by stating that the current issues causing the adjustment are the most dangerous situation that humanity has ever faced. In 2021, the bulletin reaffirmed the 100 seconds to midnight time setting. At the present time, there are five member states recognized by the NPT, Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons Treaty. China holds approximately 320 warheads. France holds approximately 290 warheads. Russia, under the New START Declaration, holds 1,326 strategic warheads deployed on 485 intercontinental ballistic missiles submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and strategic bombers. However, the Federation of American Scientists, FAS, estimate approximately 4,315 nuclear warheads, including 1,570 deployed offensive strategic warheads with 870 in storage, 1,875 non-strategic warheads, and 2,060 additional retired warheads awaiting dismantlement as of January 2020. The United Kingdom holds 215 strategic warheads, of which an estimated 120 are deployed and 95 are in storage. The United Kingdom possesses a total of four Vanguard-class Trident nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines, which together form its exclusively sea-based nuclear deterrent. The United States, under the new START Declaration, holds 1,373 strategic nuclear warheads deployed on 655 intercontinental ballistic missiles, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and strategic bombers. The U.S. also has an estimated 150 B-61 nuclear gravity bombs that are forward deployed at six NATO bases in five European countries, Aviano and Getty in Italy. Bukel in Germany, Ikerlik in Turkey, Kleinbrogo in Belgium, and Volkel in the Netherlands. The total estimated USB-61 stockpile amounts to 230, 
However, FAS estimates approximately 3,800 stockpiled warheads and 2,000 retired warheads awaiting dismantlement for a total of 5,800 warheads as of early 2020. Sylvain Cartha, one of the Bulletin's board members, is a senior scientist at the Stockholm Environmental Institute. Cartha made a valid and disturbing observation. The idea of human-caused climate change was a subject of mere academic curiosity. Since that time, greenhouse gases have increased sixfold and the Earth has warmed by one degree Celsius. Although one degree Celsius hardly sounds like much, Carther also pointed out that the thermometer is climbing higher and at a faster rate, and that it took only a drop of a few degrees to plummet the world into the last ice age. After which, a five degree increase in temperature thawed the planet back out. If we push the climate to the opposite of an ice age, we have no guarantee that the environment will remain hospitable to human life. So Van Carthen. In 2015, the bulletin brought out its Doomsday Dashboard. The dashboard takes data collected throughout the year and now also uses that information when determining the setting of the minute hand of the clock. Now the Doomsday Clock is the closest it has ever been to zero. It's a sobering thought. The idea that the human race has less than two minutes left until we are wiped from the universe is a frightening notion and should be enough to shock us into doing something about the crisis in which we're entrenched. The sword of Democles hangs over our heads and we carry on in our self-destructive race to the deadline of midnight. We can, as a species, still avoid the doom that is foretold by our most respected scientists and experts. Humanity is close to destroying itself, that much is apparent, and the threats come from two main sources, nuclear weaponry and climate change. That is also a fact that few would deny. Rachel Bronson, President and CEO of the Bulletin said, the world has entered the realm of the two-minute warning, when danger is high and vigilance is low. If decision-makers fail to act, citizens around the world should rightfully echo the words of Greta Thunberg. How dare you? The United States withdrawal from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty with Russia was just one factor in the decision to move the hands of the doomsday clock forward. Surprisingly, Iran threatening to lead the nuclear control agreement reached under the Obama administration and revoked by President Trump, and North Korea's announcement that it no longer felt bound by a self-imposed nuclear moratorium occurred too late to have any impact on the decision. Sharon Sisquoni, research professor at the George Washington University and member of the Bulletin's board said, since the United States withdrew from the nuclear agreement, Iran has been steadily stepping up its nuclear activity. The Bulletin is a respected authority on how severe the nuclear threat has been since the clock was first created in 1947. Back then, the hands were set at seven minutes to midnight. However we look at it, the doomsday clock is not a forecasting tool, and the science and security board members make no claims to predicting the future. Rather, they study existing trends and events that have already occurred and make informed decisions on how things are panning out on a global basis. Twice a year, the Science and Security Board meet to discuss the tracking and deciphering of worldwide statistics. They look at masses of data, including the number and kinds of nuclear weapons in the world, the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the degree of acidity in the oceans, and the rate the sea level is rising. The board also watches and takes note of leaders and citizens' efforts to reduce dangers and efforts by institutions, governments, markets, and civil society organizations to follow through on negotiated agreements. The Bulletin uses their extensive knowledge and experience to make something akin to a diagnosis. 
Looking at data with an expert eye, they take hard to quantify factors into account, much as physicians do with talking with patients as they attempt to make a diagnosis in a complicated case. They acknowledge that they consider as many symptoms, measurements, and circumstances as humanly and scientifically possible and eventually come to a judgment that sums up what could happen if leaders and citizens don't take action to treat the conditions. Much as a doctor would become annoyed and exasperated if a patient deliberately ignored his advice on treating a disease or ailment. Surely the bulletin members also become frustrated when they are forced to move the doomsday clock's hands forward toward midnight, rather than backward, away from our doom, despite their sage advice. One of the most exasperating questions the bulletin face is the one questioning their political motives for the doomsday clock. The answer to the question of the clock being a scare tactic to advance a political agenda the bulletin responded with, Ensuring the survival of our societies and the human species is not a political agenda. Cooperating with other countries to achieve control of extremely dangerous technologies should not involve partisan politics. If scientists involved with the bulletin are critical of current policy on nuclear weapons and climate change, it is because those policies increase the possibility of self-destruction. If nuclear weapons exist and can be used, we as a species risk destruction of our civilization and irreversible contamination of our planet. Such disaster has not occurred yet because so far national leaders have heeded warnings. Many times over the past 73 years, under advisement from the Science and Security Board, governments and world powers have set up communication channels with adversaries, negotiated treaties to control weaponry, taken steps to reduce arsenals, and engaged past enemies in cooperation. Only by employing diplomacy, exchanges of information, open communications, and by engendering trust can we hope to prevent nuclear war. Earth's climate continues to change. The changing climate is not entirely humanity's doing. The planet has historically and prehistorically gone through many cycles of climate change, long before humanity arrived on the surface. However, the accelerated rates that have occurred since records began is primarily down to humanity. We risk dire consequences, in particular, disruptions in the environment, disastrous events, including extended droughts and rising temperatures beyond human endurance, changes in growing seasons, sea level rise, and extinction of endangered species also threaten human survival. We humans are an exceptional species. We develop many beneficial inventions, some of which have come around to bite it, like nuclear weapons and the fossil fuel powered machines that contribute to climate change. However, we know these inventions work, so we should also be able to find ways to reduce or eliminate the harm they cause. In order to make good the damage that has already been brought upon our long suffering planet, we need concerted cooperation worldwide to prevent calamity. The main question is how we avoid our own demise. Opinions on what will be our eventual and premature doom include the results of another global pandemic, such as a resurgence of something along the lines of the most recent COVID pandemic, the Black Death, bubonic plague, or Ebola breaking out but others believe our doom will not come about as the result of a global pandemic we didn't foresee and could do nothing to prevent or contain. And neither will it be an asteroid strike, similar to the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. Most believe we will construct our own ruin. Humans will self-destruct and take the planet with us as we go. We now have 100 metaphorical seconds in which to realize what we're doing 
and not only stop it all, but effectively and permanently put the process into reverse and save ourselves, our home planet, and the rest of the inhabitants. There is no planet B for us to resort to.